I, I'm not a lady. I'm not involved. I don't know. I will. I will leave. I will leave that up to you and the rest of the ladies. I don't care. Well, my question is, I would. It's it's the end of the greenhouse season. Yeah. But if you wanted to. And the side air conditioner goes with it. It's live. Shop tried calling me this morning. I mean, how many months have they waited and drugged their feet? Oh, oh I'm just fuming. All right, I believe that it is about time for us to begin. So girls, why don't you get sit down? The line of announcements this morning, I think we've got two meeting notices on the bulletin board in the back. Uh, the first one is uh, this coming week, uh, I believe it begins today, uh, Washington Street, Bellsville, Ohio. Uh, their meeting and uh, Tony Huntsman, their located preacher now, is going to be uh, conducting that meeting for them. And I've known Tony for years, but I've never heard him preach except on the radio. So, um, so remember that meeting. And then Cedar Avenue uh, is having just a, I think it's a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They call it a Family Bible Week. Um, and they are doing classes, and I believe their theme is the uh, rainbow promise, and not what the world thinks of as the rainbow promise. Um, 
So we just received that flyer this morning, and I don't remember the dates on that. But that's coming up. I believe it's in July. So there's there's a few weeks ahead on that. Yeah. Uh, in the li other line, remember Dennis? He seemed seemed some better uh, on Wednesday when we visited with him after services. Um, and remember the others on our prayer list as well, uh, especially uh, those who are away from us today. Let's remember uh, Pamela and uh, Dylan and Lacey as they're making adjustments to their lives. Let's uh, hope those adjustments go as well as can be expected. If you will, grab a blue song, but 225 will be our first song this morning, 225. Uh, most of these songs are off of a uh, request list that Ruth made for us, uh, songs that she wanted to sing. So I've been trying to uh, work through those songs, and I haven't sang this song for a long time, but it, it fits well with today's, today's theme for the lesson, Heaven Holds All to Me, 225. Earth holds no treasures but perish with music, however precious they be. Yet there's a country to which I am going. Heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter its glory will be, joy without measure will be my treasure, heaven holds all to me, out on the hills of that wonder. Happy, contented, and free. Loved ones are waiting and watching my home. Heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. Instead of T25, 
229, I'm sorry, that's the wrong number. Uh, let's turn to 231. 231, Hilltops of Glory. <clears throat> Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way, higher I'm climbing each passing day, hilltops of glory now rise and view, where all shall be made new, hilltops of glory I now Oh, brother, won't you come go with me safe on the mountain? I soon shall stand hilltops of glory land, way down in Egypt, mid burning sand. Moses had started for Canaan's land, never turned backward, always a sin, until the journey's end. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you? Come go with me, safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand, hilltops of glory land. Let prince of Jesus be for us lead, we tread life's journey, his warnings he gave all allurements cannot prevail. I'm on the upward trail, hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come to on the mountain I soon shall stand hilltops of glory Luke 10 starting with 25 Luke 10 25 and behold a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying master what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, said, Thou shalt love thy, thy Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willingly to justify himself said to Jesus, And who is my brother? And Jesus answered, saying, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. So a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bounded up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pences and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will pay, repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? 
And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. And it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art care careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary had chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Here to you, mark your song, that's number 23. That'll be the introduction song this morning. As we uh, wrapped up that scripture reading, there's a couple of things that uh, kind of uh, Luke, I think, is wanting us to see in the end of this chapter. And first of all, don't ever ask Jesus a question unless you really want the answer, because that's what this uh, lawyer was doing. He was trying to justify himself, and he thought he could do so by asking Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? What are my responsibilities towards an individual? And so he's wanting Jesus to identify who a neighbor is. And so Jesus gives him a parable in which there can be very little doubt that uh, smack this fellow right between the eyes. Uh, also, I want you to notice what Jesus says, though, when this lawyer is uh, testing him. Jesus said that uh, in order to inherit eternal life, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's kind of a theme for today's lesson, to love God with all that we have. We are going to continue our elements of worship, our acts of worship. And this morning, last week, we looked at the Lord's Supper, or the communion, as I prefer to call it. Um, as a side note, we were discussing during Bible class the word um, poionia, the Greek word that is translated fellowship. And the, when we're talking about communion in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, talks about the English Standard Version says a participation in the body of Christ. That's the Greek word koinonia. In the, the same word that is translated fellowship is translated a participation in the body of Christ or a communion in the body of Christ, depending on your translations. Um, so we're going to look a little bit more at that word koinonia later on. But turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, right, right now to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. The Apostle Paul leaves instructions at the close of this letter. Now, I find it interesting. Uh, not a lot of time is spent on this. It's almost, uh, by the way, I want you to, and Paul touches upon this uh, element of worship, the laying by in store. Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. And so like I say, it's a very short paragraph, but it is quite to the point. Uh, money is always uh, a topic that can get folks worked up. And I suppose it's because of the historically uh, churches have become greedy. 
You think about the work that is laid out in the New Testament scriptures. A church does not have to have a large amount of money in order to function as God would have it. And it's only when we go beyond what's written and start implementing things that are really man-invented ideas that might be pleasant enough or serve a purpose enough, but nevertheless, beyond what the scriptures say, it's only when we go beyond what the scripture says that we need large amounts of money in order to function as a church. Um, and so as, as various groups, various religious bodies have uh, gone beyond what is written in the scriptures about what the activities of a church are, then they have needed more and more and more of an income. One of the things I remember as a young person, uh, we had a very good friend by the name of Paul Tullius. And Paul has passed away a long time ago. But Paul didn't go to church anywhere. And it was because, in part, because of the money topic. Paul was raised in the Catholic Church, same as I was. He was older, older than my grandparents. But Paul said that they, they had a, uh, a located priest one time up at Lowell that uh, actually figured out how much money every family in the parish should be given. Paul said he figured out that somehow that we had 10 milk cows and that a cow should give an average of so much milk. And milk was selling for, and he had it down to the penny of what he thought should be in their collection envelope, which they used every week. And Paul said what he didn't realize was when a family's trying to raise, you know, a number of children, and there are expenses that people don't realize exist. So that was such a sore topic with my friend Paul that it just bittered him to no end about the money topic. And if I learned one thing about that from Paul, it was money should never be the object of church. And so I'm going to tread not necessarily lightly out I'm going to give you what the scriptures say about this. But I want you to understand at the very last of this lesson, we're going to talk about attitude. And that's more important than anything that I have to say between now and the end of the lesson is attitude. God never intended money to be the focal point of any religious body. Like any other act of worship, giving should be something that we desire to take part in. Just like singing and praying and remembering Jesus. We should, we should desire to give back to the one who has given to us. The New Testament spends very little time on the act of worship and we do the same this morning. It has always been beneficial for me when studying a topic, ask the question, why? First of all, why do we need a treasury? I think there are some obvious answers, but some of our obvious answers may not align with the scriptures. And so it's always been easier if I understand why in order to process that through my mind. So the first reason that is given in the Bible and the predominant reason is benevolence. Benevolence specifically for other church members. While your Bibles are open to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, I want you to notice who this is for. Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints. We'll discuss that a little bit more in depth in a little while. But I want you to understand this is for Christians who are in need, both locally and abroad. And I'm going to get into Galatians chapter 6, so for a moment we're going to skip that one. 
Second reason the Bible gives us, and this is this is secondary by a long shot. The Bible talks about preaching, the spreading of the gospel. If you will, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And down in verse 11, I just want to draw one verse out for a moment, and we'll revisit this passage as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 11. And why, um, I'm sorry, that's... Second Corinthians chapter 11, I believe maybe, hold on, let me get my notes. I believe we might have gotten a second one put in there somewhere. Seven, if you'll begin with me in verse seven. Second Corinthians 11 in verse seven. Paul says, or did I commit sin in humbling myself? so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. We're just going to stop there because I know I'm going to revisit that. I want you to understand, Paul had, particularly in later years, financial support that allowed him to travel the globe to preach the gospel. That was authorized and still is authorized today as an expense that is the church. Finally, there are a few things that might fall under a category that I would term as necessities. Obviously, the uh, communion, for example, the fruit of the vine has to come from somewhere. Now, I'm sure that one of us could purchase it and would be glad to purchase it. In fact, I think Celia probably donated that. Um, what we use. But there are songbooks that, and Bibles as well. Um, and the example that I have here on the slide is a building. Hebrews 10.25 says, Neglect not the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But the more so as you see the day approaching. We're drawing near, depending on your translation. So we know and recognize that we are to assemble together. How we're to assemble, where we're to assemble, we find various options in the scriptures. We find options like meeting in homes. Nothing wrong with that. It's biblical. Or we have in, in, in Ephesus, in the book of Acts, the apostle Paul used the lecture hall of Tyrannius. And so I believe in studying that, even though the scriptures does not say it, I believe we could conclude that the Apostle Paul rented that lectureship hall for those individuals. Now, again, those are expenses that are involved with the previous two items. We call those, I call those necessary in order to preach the gospel. There are certain things that are necessary and expenses would come out of that. Our offer as we contribute is a partnership. We talked a little bit about partnership in Bible class this morning. Benevolence was Paul's focal point when he wrote about the collection. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. That was the whole purpose for which he was writing. Christianity is a fellowship or a partnership, as I prefer to call it. Koinonia is the Greek word. And in this partnership, we are joined together. I want you to notice something that uh, Paul writes. Let's go to where we were in Bible class this morning. First of all, Philippians chapter one. If you look at this, Philippians chapter one, and I had not noticed this uh, previous to, to this study of Philippians. But Paul says in Philippians chapter one and in verse three, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for all making my prayer with joy. 
because of your partnership, the English Standard Version says. Your translation may very well use the term fellowship, but it is the Greek word koinonia. And it means, a, in the context in which it's used, a spiritual union. It carries a connotation of a marriage union. We are partners with our spouse, but the Bible says it's more than that. That the two shall become one flesh. Clear back in the book of Genesis. And so we as Christians, Paul uses the analogy of a human body. Go back here for a moment in um, uh, Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And in chapter 4, Paul says uh, down in, let's just begin in verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. He's talking about the koinonia eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called in one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. If we are so joined together, it stands to reason that we should join also in whatever partnership we may be in with the congregation. Turn back with me to uh, John, 1 John, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 1. <coughs> in 1 John chapter 1, and in verse 3, John says that we have seen and heard, or that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship or partnership with us. Indeed, our fellowship or partnership is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete or full. John is writing about that fellowship, that partnership together. When we partner with someone, we invest in that person. John says that our investing is in God. Our investing is in Christ. And our fellowship one with another is an investment with each other. Galatians, if you'll go back there for a moment. Paul's letter to the Galatian Christians, Galatians chapter 6. And in verse 1, if you begin there. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Paul here says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so Paul is talking in context here about helping each other, a partnership that we feel one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul, in writing to 1 Corinthians, one could make the argument that this collection was only for a specific event at a specific time, and so therefore we don't need to participate in taking up a collection today. However, I want to draw your attention to the idea of partnership again, this time from the book of Acts, chapter 2, and in verse 42. This following the day of Pentecost, 
You may wonder, and this has caused some confusion for some, the way it is worded. But you may wonder, some people will say that this is an order of worship. And in fact, I one time did not agree with that. But the more I study worship and orderly worship, the more I believe that Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 gives us a pattern that we pretty much follow. Listen to this. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, that would be preaching, right? The fellowship. Well, I want to introduce to you the thought that fellowship in the context of the partnership, in the context in which Luke is writing, is in reference to the offer, the collection. In fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Again, I have not always believed this. I, in fact, rejected it at one point in time that this was a pattern. But I do believe the more I study it, the longer I live, the more I believe that this is description. The only thing absent here in an act of worship is singing. And that can fall even under the apostles' doctrine. I believe this is talking about the assembly and elements of worship that are described here are teaching, fellowship or partnership, communion, and prayers. We see those very clearly laid out. Notice what it says following verse. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who were who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day attending temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In thinking about partnership, in thinking about being a body, I can tell you in the line of benevolence, if one part of my body, the other day, the other day my wife, caught her toe on the cast iron bed frame in our bedroom. Now, I could talk about what a klutzy wife I've got, but I love her, so I'm not going to do that. But what I do have to say is she walked with a limp the whole night. Now, you might say that a toe is, number one, a very small body part. Number two, you might say that it's not an appealing body part. I don't know about you, but I don't particularly care for feet. They're not necessarily, they don't necessarily wig me out or anything, but they're not necessarily my favorite body part. But you see the effect when we have a toe stub. Now, I happen to be missing one. And I can tell you it affects your balance, which affects the way you walk, which affects your back, which affects all kinds of things throughout your life that you don't even think about. And I can tell you one thing. When your toe hurts, there's pain through your entire body. With the church, it's like that. When one individual member goes through a dark period of time in their lives, We've got some today who are absent because of a dark period in their life. The entire body of believers suffers. So if one person is in need, all should feel the need and compensate accordingly. I want you to notice a word in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 1, Paul uses the word, for the saints. 
You'll see that in every translation of our Bible or something along those lines for the saints. The word saint in the context refers to one who has been sanctified by the blood of Christ. The collection is never used for those who are not members of the church. We as individuals have every right, every commandment, every authority, and should help those who are outside of Christ. But our partnership, our fellowship, is not with those. For what fellowship hath the temple of the living God with Baal? What partnership has God's people with those of the world? Our partnership is with Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. That tells us who our partnership is with. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 through 46 that I read a moment ago, that partnership was with their fellow believers, those who had been sanctified by the blood of Christ. I just wanted to throw that out there when we're talking about benevolence. Our partnership is with those who are faithful Christians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 26, if you'll go back there with me, I want you to see this interconnection once again, this partnership one with another. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 26, here the Apostle Paul says, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice. It's that partnership. It is that interconnection, that spiritual relationship we have with the Father, with Jesus Christ, with each other. Secondly, we talked about preaching the gospel. While this seems pretty straightforward and elementary, I don't want to take too much for granted. Just like anything else, this also can be perverted. And we can go beyond what is written in the scriptures. Worship, nor preaching of the gospel, has anything to do with food, fun, and festivities. Romans chapter 14. I want you to look at what Paul says. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit. I want you to think about that. That is the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Food, fun, and festivities can be done as individuals. We gather together. We have potlucks. We enjoy each other's company. I brought Don a, high, a, a box of bees the other day. Now that was fun. You know, I hope Don's had as much fun with them as I had picking them up. But, uh, you know, that had nothing to do with preaching the gospel. But it did have something to do with my partnership with Don as believers. I wouldn't pick up a, a, a box of bees for just anybody. But, well, maybe I would. I don't know. They are bees after all. So while Paul took financial support, as we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, while Paul took financial support from other churches, also also worked to support himself. Let's look at those two passages again for just a moment. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and in verse 7, 2 Corinthians 11, 7, Paul says, Or did I commit sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. Now, when Paul talks about humbling himself, Paul had an attitude, one who does not work does not eat. And we'll see that in 1 Thessalonians in just a moment. But Paul at Corinth, for whatever reason, decided to accept, and called it humbling himself when he did so, 
accept funding from other churches. He says, I robbed other churches accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. As I mentioned before, I believe that this, our brothers who came from Philippi. Philippi is located in Macedonia. And Paul refers to the partnership that Philippi had with his work. They supplied his every need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. God knows that Paul loved the Christians of Corinth. Paul said, I will not be silent on the fact that I did not take a dime from that congregation. 1 Thessalonians, Paul sets forth a thing. Now I believe that in the world, in the religious world today, there's a lot of lazy preachers. And I'm just going to put it that way. There's a lot of lazy preachers. Even in the church, I think there's a lot of lazy preachers. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 9 says this, For you remember me, brother, remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how like a father with his children. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. Friends, again, maybe this is a pet topic of mine, but the idea... There is a concept, those who, those who are called to work in the church, you know, the laborer is worthy of his hire. But I believe a lot of people take advantage of that. And there's no need for that. Paul set an example of working for himself. And I think a lot of people could take a good lesson from what the Apostle Paul did here in Thessalonica. How many preachers, I have to ask myself, how many preachers, how many men would be willing to follow Jesus' instructions that he gave the apostles in Matthew chapter 9? I want to go back there for just a minute. Matthew chapter 9, and I don't know how far we're going to go for sure in this, but Jesus sent out his... Matthew chapter 9, and in, I'm not sure this is the correct passage. I may have a typo here. It's not Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, I apologize. These 12 in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without paying. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts. No bag for your journey or two tunics. Not even a change of clothes, my friends. No sandals. 
or staff. The laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace be upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will receive you or listen to your words, will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet. When you leave the house or town, truly I say to you, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. I want you to question, would you have the courage to do that? No change of clothes. No shoes. I didn't say anything about socks, but I suspect no socks. No walking stick. No money. Not even a money belt. I wonder, is it any wonder that we have become so misfocused? I'm not saying the laborer is worthy of his hire. Jesus teaches that. Those who were there in that location, they were to look for support in full faith. Trusting. Trusting good, righteous people to provide for their need. They were to go with nothing. We have the nerve. Random thoughts. Uh, this is uh, typically, traditionally, we pass a collection plate or basket. Usually, most of the time, it's done in or around the communion portion of our service. I've questioned in the past, Don and I were in a conversation last week about this. I do want to talk about this a little bit more in depth in a different lesson. But my question is, is that the way it should be done? The truth is, the Bible doesn't tell us how we're to lay by a source, simply that it is to be done. So I certainly have no problem with that approach. I mean, it is something we do traditionally. However, just let me indulge me for a moment in my random thoughts. I want you to think about the pattern that the Old Testament was used and what the early Christians would have been accustomed to under Judaism. And Steve and I talked about this, and we actually debated this quite a lot uh, when this congregation began, uh, the collection. How do we take it up? Because I'll tell you what, as, as Vernon passes it around, he may not make you nervous, but... As, as Vernon usually passes the collection plate, I feel like if there are visitors, they feel obligated to put something in. That's not the purpose. A visitor has no, no partnership with us unless they're a Christian. And, and, and nobody should feel pressured at any point to give what they have to give. But in the Old Testament, Luke chapter 21, if you'll go back there with me in our Bibles, Luke chapter 21, we see a pattern, and this is the best place I know of to give you a description of what happens. Jesus is teaching his disciples about their benevolence, about their giving and laying by in store. And he's teaching them, it says, um, sorry, I'm in John and not in Luke, makes a big difference. Um, Luke chapter 21, I want to look at verse uh, verse 1. Uh, this often is referred to in your Bibles, might be the widow's mite. Mine is the widow's offering because the mite is an English uh, uh, translation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. Now this box typically set at the entrance of a synagogue or of the temple. It was in the entryway. It was not uh, something they didn't pass a collection basket. So this was something people did as they entered. Um, remember also, Jesus said when he drove the money changers out of the temple, my father's house is to be a house of prayer. Business was not conducted. Business should not be conducted during worship service. 
But nevertheless, you could argue this any direction you want to argue it, and I really have no problem either way. But like I say, it's a random thought. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Now, I want you to notice, again, the English Standard Version uses an offering box in this instance. I personally like the idea. The only congregation that I'm familiar of that uses this is Anchor Point, Alaska. Uh, Anchor Point uses an offering box. It was rather odd. We were up there. I was ready to uh, contribute, ready to lay by in stores. I worship with that congregation because I do feel that it is an act of worship. I know some folks uh, do their giving at their local body, and I'm okay with that. But uh, I have always and will always contribute wherever I worship because it is an act of worship. And uh, so I had, I had my typical offering ready uh, to put in the plate when it passed. And it, we got to the end of services, no plate had been passed. And it was announced at the end of services. For our, if you're visiting with us, and I'm, I'm used to our customs here, uh, we don't take up a collection. But there is an offering box placed at the back as described in, that, in Luke chapter 21. And you may lay by on store as you feel the need if you haven't done so already. And I just said that struck me as a very unique situation, but I really liked that it actually had biblical backing. Um, because typically we don't have instructions of things to be accomplished. The final point this morning, most important point of all, if you get nothing else out of this sermon, attitude, if indeed giving is an act of worship, then attitude in which we do it is everything. Paul even says the point is this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the point is is this. And Paul makes a very blunt point. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's just common sense. We understand it as farmers. It's a concept that is easy to grasp. Each one of you must give as he has decided in his heart. Your inner being. He says, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Again, that goes back to my questioning about passing a basket. We don't want to force. He says, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is, is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. The attitude in which we give is the key component. If we're giving because we feel obligated, it's just not the same as if we give with a cheerful heart. Paul says over in chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, joy. Joy. Well, I don't know about you, but the idea of giving 
hard-earned money away may not always be joyful. Paul says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed with a, in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part. Now there's that koinonius. I believe that is the word there that is translated in my Bible as taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. According as we urged Titus, that he had started so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel also in this act of, in this act of grace also. Paul is so encouraged by a group of people in Macedonia that have been willing to give above what any could ask. He said that the abundance of joy It's always joyful to be in partnership with God's people. But God wants it to be in our heart first. He wants it to be part of us, as he said here a moment ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. They gave themselves first to the Lord, first to God. God doesn't expect anything out of us until we give our hearts, souls to God. I'll leave you with that thought this morning. We've come to a time in our service where we encourage you. Should there be anything lacking in your spiritual life, we encourage you to consider it. Consider it seriously. First, give your heart to God. If your heart is not with God, then nothing else we do is quite right. We've got to get first things first. Got your song books, song number 23, All Things Are Ready. <clears throat> All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye
First Corinthians chapter 10, if you will. First Corinthians chapter 10, and down in, uh, well, let's, let's begin in verse uh, 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from my poetry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a quinea or participation? In the blood of Christ. The bread that we break is a koinonia, or participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Let's partake of that bread now in memory of Jesus. Let's partake of it. Let us think of our partnership in his death. His body dying on the cross. It's about. Father in heaven, as we humbly bow before you in prayer, we are so thankful, Lord, for thy son Jesus, who came to this world, lived a perfect life, sinned free of sin, who was condemned to death by people who hated light. Father, as we pause to remember Jesus in his body, through this bread, we pray, Father, that you might be worthy of the greatness of the sacrifice that you have given us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Bible, the Hebrew writer talks about there being no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And so, to ratify the New Testament, Jesus came and offered himself, one for all, on the cross. And so, as we participate in this memorial feast, we participate in his death and his righteousness and the good news of the gospel. 
Father in heaven, as we humbly bow before you in prayer once again to offer thanks for this fruit of the vine. We're thankful not for the fruit of the vine only, but we're thankful for Jesus. And what it reminds us of, the blood, the blood of your only begotten Son that flowed so freely. Father, we pray that you would bless this as we partake of it. Bless our partnership with you. Help us to draw closer to you and to be more beneficial to you. And help us to accept your will in our lives. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Brings our service to a close this morning. I believe, I guess I'm mistaken, I believe we've been through all the acts of worship, the elements of worship. Hopefully that uh, helps particularly the young people to understand why we do what we do and how we do it. Um, I've got some other topics that have been requested as well. We're going to try to work through those, but just a reminder, if you have a topic, that you want to hear or know more about, uh, just jot it down for me or send me a text message or, or whatever. And I've got a running list in my phone of sermon topics that have been requested. So we are, we may it may take a while, but Lord willing, we will address those issues and you know, try to try to help help us to excel in you know, godly things. 611, we'll sing this song. Oh, one other update that I meant to mention. Uh, we are waiting on a price for an air conditioner unit. The unit out back, the outside unit is bad, and the unit inside the furnace system. The furnace is okay, but the air conditioner portion, all of it has to be replaced. And it's old enough, it's obsolete, we can't just replace part of it. So, anyway, just an update on that. Six eleven. Take the name of Jesus with you. Sing the song and the down the green and lines and Take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you. the sorrow and of woe. Oh, Father.
I'm going to try to record this right here. So, there's a senior positive six. I'm going to try to record this right here.